Dr. Carla Kerlmeyer. Um, she is the director of our clinic and uh, an expert echocardiographer also, so she'll pre present. All right, Carla. So this is a 37-year-old man who um, has a history of end-stage renal disease, and he's had two renal transplants, hypertension known by cuspid aortic valve, and he presented with two-month history of worsening dyspnea exertion. <laughs> he could only climb barely one flight of stairs, and lightheadedness was standing. He's a former smoker. There's no history of tobacco or illicit drug use. He, there is a family history of premature atherosclerosis, but no history of any other heart, familial heart diseases. And you can see his meds, and you can see his allergies there. So basically on exam, you can see he's got pretty normal vitals. He's got a, the only abnormal thing on his exam is he's got a murmur, a three out of six systolic ejection murmur, which radiates to his carotids bilaterally. His EKG was a little bit abnormal in that it showed some LVH with QRS widening and repolarization abnormality. In a prolonged QT, his labs were all normal except for uh, elevated creatinine and a low platelet count. So of course, the, ne the next step was to get an echo. And you can see here on, his e on the first image on the left that he's got significant left ventricular hypertrophy. The ventricle's very hyperdynamic. You can see that the aortic valve is very calcified and with restricted opening. And you can see that the measurements of the intraventricular septum there on the bottom, 1.5 centimeters, and the posterior wall, 1.7 centimeters. On the panel on the right, you can see that he has very mild uh, posteriorly uh, directed jet of eccentric mitral regurgitation, and he has a lot of flow acceleration in the left ventricular outflow track. When we look at his short axis, you can see that his valve is severely calcified. It's really difficult to tell if it's bicuspid or not. Um, and on the right-hand panel, you can see right after the mitral valve closes, it, it, it makes a little jump towards the septum. So he's got nice, uh, he's got nice systolic anterior motion of that anterior mitral leaflet. And if you couldn't see it there, you can really clearly see it here on the M mode. Well, this one's not working. Let's see. Maybe it's this. also got some posterior, go. posterior mitral annular disease to go yeah. along with his Ooh, aortic. Absolutely. So here's his And little... the whole mitral apparatus is shoved up into the ventricle if you looked at that on the short axis, too. Right. Oh, OK. So we'll. Um, you, you actually didn't need to see the, the SAM because you had flow convergence right. well below the valve and right. the outflow track. Right. So you knew even before you did your imaging to show the sand that it would be uh, structured. Absolutely. So here is um, a, a nice view of just showing you, I think there was the one back here. Let's see. Oh yeah, we already saw that one. And you can see, really see the SAM nicely on that apical three on the right-hand panel. So here's just showing you that he's got a very hyperdynamic LV and he's got a lot of flow within the left ventricle due to that hyperdynamic state. When we went on to image his left ventricular outflow tract, we see continuous wave Doppler. You can see that the, he's got both significant valvular AS and subvalvular AS. Um, and both of them, the valvular AS is approaching four and a half meters per second. You can see the velocity of that subvalvular AS or that left ventricular outflow track dynamic obstruction is uh, 4.14 meters per second listed there. And this... That's very nice. Actually, you may not see this all the time, but, you know, this is very nice. Tells you about the different timing of the gradients. So they're not necessarily additive, right? They're not in series, and their timing is very different. So then the, the sonographer went on to do um, a Valsalva, and you can see with Valsalva, here's the measurements for the valvular AS, and we're getting a aortic valve area of about 0.73 if we use the stroke volume through the right ventricular outflow track. And you can see that the dynamic obstruction increases significantly to a peak velocity of 490 centimeters per second or 96 millimeters of mercury, as expected with the left ventricular outflow track dynamic obstruction. This is just showing you that the relaxation on his tissue Doppler on the lateral corner is really impaired, and that he's got elevated filling pressures just looking at the E velocity at the tips. So the question here is, um, based on his 2D echo Doppler findings, what should the patient be referred for next? Should he undergo invasive hemodynamic testing and coronary angiography? Should he undergo CT angiography? Should he undergo MRI, or cardiac MRI, or should he undergo uh, functional stress testing? Carl, you said he'd had recent onset of dyspnea on exertion and positional lightheadedness? Yeah, for the recent last, last two months, okay. yes. 
Okay, well, very good. So this is the, the, the ACC guidelines for hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, and you're absolutely right. The next step, step would be MRI imaging, and the reason for that is we need to make sure that that intraventricular septum is thick enough for the patient to undergo either alcohol septal ablation or myomectomy. It needs to be at least more than 1.5 centimeters thick to avoid uh, development of ventricular septal defect. He doesn't really need a CT angiogram, even though he has risk factors, because he's only 37 years old. That's recommended for people more than, men more than 40, women more than 50. And of course, he can undergo stress testing, because he has a huge left ventricular outflow tract dynamic obstruction, and that would lead to hemodynamic collapse for this individual. But for other people who you want to see if they have a dynamic obstruction with exercise and they don't have it at rest, of course, it would be reasonable. Um, and again, CMR is very helpful in apical hypertrophy cases, as you saw uh, with the previous cases discussed here. And so this is his CMR. And so you can see on this four-chamber view, you can see that there's uh, a lot of severe septal hypertrophy, and you can see that the LV is very hyperdynamic. When we go on to this next view, you, the three-chamber view, you can see that there that the septum is measuring here about 1.8 centimeters. You can see the very nice SAM, and you also can see the very nice posterior directed, very mild uh, mitral regurgitant jet. One okay. Can, can you give him a... I'm trying to... You want to go back to the long, yeah. Okay, let's try here. So why isn't it not plain? And then I'll... Okay, right here, this one, right? Yeah, on the, on the aortic valve, it looks like the valve is domed as well. So just off of this view, it looks like it's probably a bicuspid valve. Mm. Right. Okay. And then in this view, it really is, I mean, compared to the echo, it's hard to tell, but you can really see that this is a very nice bicuspid valve with fusion of the left and right cusps. And the anatomical valve area calculated here was 0.9 cent centimeters squared. Mm. And then this is phase contrast imaging, and Dippin is way better at interpreting this than I am, but in the left-hand panel, because there is no aliasing at 550 centimeters per second, that um, is uh, the peak velocity across that, um, that valve. And then on the right-hand panel, you can see that there is um, uh, aliasing in the left ventricular outflow tract, which is showing you that there is a dynamic obstruction there. And you can see that regurgitation poster, mit mitral regurgitation jet. Mm. So based on the CMR images, the patient should be referred for what? A AICD placement, aortic valve replacement, myectomy, AVR and myectomy, or alcohol septal ablation and TAVR. Absolutely. So he has all the class one indications for a myectomy, his age, he's less than 40. Um, you know, the fact that he has concomitant disease and needs an aortic valve replacement, um, and the fact that his septum is thick enough and he has a very large dynamic gradient despite medical therapy. Mm. So basically, he underwent a surgical myectomy and placement of a mechanical number 21 St. Jude's valve. Um, and he did okay post op. Um, but this is his, at one year, he started, he, he, he mentioned that the dyspnea on exertion never really did go away. He was always very, very, he still couldn't go up that one flight of stairs. The dizziness and lightheadedness he had was gone, but he just, he, 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 the dyspnea persisted. And he was noted to have a systolic ejection murmur on exam, so this led to this echo. And basically what you're seeing here is that he still has a significant hypertrophy. He does have a mechanical prosthetic valve, although you can't see it very well. There's no longer any sort of systolic anterior motion of that mitral valve. And this is his Doppler. So this is the continuous wave Doppler on the apical three view on the left. And you can see that there's a very high velocity, which looks like a valvular velocity. So very high velocity across that prosthetic valve. Um, and you can see that there no longer is that dynamic obstruction. When you look on the right, that's just the pulse wave of the descending aortic supersternal view that I put in there for you. And then this question is, based on this follow-up TTT imaging, what should be the initial test that this patient has now to evaluate that very high gradient and velocity across that valve? I'll tell you the Doppler velocity index was, at, was normal. Carla, what, what was the type of prosthesis? Sorry, I may have missed it. It's a number one, a number 21 St. Jude, Jude mechanical aortic valve. And DVI was normal? 
DVI was normal. Yeah, it was normal. <clears throat> okay, so we're split here, so I'm gonna go back. Because basically the key of what's going on in this with that valve is actually in the right-hand panel. If you look at what's happening in diastole, he has holodiastolic flow reversal in diastole. So what that's suggesting is that he has some significant aortic regurgitation that we're just not picking up in, on that continuous wave Doppler. So if once you've figured out that it's that's what it is, that's what the problem is, rather than a you know the, rather than obstruction of the valve, you want to pick the test that will allow you to localize where that aortic regurgitation is coming from and also quantify it the best. So if you do CT angiography, that will allow you to localize but not necessarily quantitate. Invasive angiography and fluoroscopy, again, you can localize, but it's not the best way to quantitate. CMR is probably our best way to quantitate but not localize. So you're right, the best next test to do both of those things for this particular valve would be TEE. And is there any more discussion from our panel about See that? See, the TEE bar is growing very gradually. <laughs> 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 yeah, I would just say, <laughs> no, I would just. It's going to revert to 100%, maybe. <laughs> but th really, there was no AI that you could see, I mean, or, or is this just for a case presentation? There was no AI yeah. that you could see, but you saw all that turbulence. Um, there was just a lot of color turbulence in the whole LV and the whole left ventricular alpha track, kind of what it looked like pre-op, but you it? couldn't pick up an AI jet anywhere. I, don't, I hate to sound like an old man, but what was his blood pressure? Did he have a, a wide pulse pressure when the, on this return follow-up? Did anybody? You know, I don't, that, I can't answer that question. Like Unfortunately, I didn't look thing. at that. I mean, that, I hate to, I'm just no, saying. No, I think it's important. <laughs> I have a comment, too. I would just say to those out in the audience having read, and, and read Dr. Uh, Zogby's uh, stuff on mechanical valves is that if you just suspect a dysfunctional prosthetic valve, the option is always TEE. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, that is changing AI, with, yeah. CT, it's with CT and geography, oh, right, but, yes. but there's so many things you can miss, but there were some. All right, if we stay here long enough, everybody will vote for TEE, so show us the TEE. <laughs> so this is the, this is the TEE, and basically what you're seeing is on the left-hand panel, you can see the two leaflets, and they seem to be opening and closing there pretty nicely. On the right-hand panel, you can see that there's a paravalvular leak. It looks like to me that it's at about 9 o'clock and extending kind of up to between 11 and a 12 o'clock. And then there's also another little leak over there at 3 o'clock. Tell me some more. Yeah. I'm not blown away. I mean, there is perivalvular leak, but, but you said he's you he had go. severe. So this is the long axis view. And again, you can see that posteriorly, there's a perivalvular leak. There may actually be one anteriorly, Anterior. but I, it's hard to see it for sure. But there's another little jet there anteriorly. That's a great case regarding, uh, you know, these valves, is you have to scan, you know, what she showed. That's why he wanted more information because... You know, if you're just barely at, at the edge of where the leaks are, you want to go below it a little bit just to see what's happening, go above. This view shows you that there is perivalvular significant probably regurgitation. Right. And also remember, even in the guidelines, and the old guidelines tells us that transthoracic and TEE are complementing each other, meaning I can't see much on the anterior portion. Similarly, I can't see much on the posterior portion if I do transthoracic. So you have to use these two to help you identify where where the uh, regurgitation is. Would you go, Bill or Steve or, or, or Roberto, would you go deep transgastric and look back at the valve, try to get some better feel for it? I mean, you might be able to get some. Steve, what do you think? Would you go deep transgastric or are you happy with this? I always go deep transgastric. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, I I mean, re, but remember, remember, even if I see a long jet, it doesn't tell me about severity. Correct. So the severity criteria are flow, right, along the lines of what we just talked about. Also, the area of the regurgitation, so vena contract as much as possible, the other ones. Length of the jet doesn't help you. Eccentricity here is not going to help you anything in the LV outflow track. Good. <clears throat> okay. Great. So I know that this was discussed earlier, so Dr. Zagabi was talking about it, so I just stuck that up there. This is what they're using to evaluate these, these paravalvular leaks in the TAVR st um, studies, so I'm just putting that up there for everyone to see. And then basically I'll just give you follow-up. So this patient, um, 
Because he wasn't that symptomatic and he's now 38 years old, it was decided to just continue to follow him closely with follow-up echoes and with development of worsening symptoms because at some point he's headed for another valve replacement. I mean, you could treat him medically and see, because ventricle, to me, the ventricle hasn't dilated yet unless you tell me it was dilated and didn't look like it. Mm -mm. Uh, you know, at some point in time, most likely he's going to need something else. On top of that, you know, he has hypertrophy, has so many, a lot of diastolic dysfunction, so many other things that, you know, could get into this. But it looks like AR is going to be significant. He's going to have to either maybe do a plug. To well, this that's down I'm the surprised line. the pluggers didn't exactly. come running at him. Miguel? A plug. Yeah, I, I was going to comment on that. You know, the, what he has now, and this is for the audience important, he has now combined ASAI. Right. Patients with ASAI are beaten both ways because the pressure overload keeps you with hypertrophy, and now you have the volume overload in a relatively small cavity with hypertrophy. They don't last long, meaning symptom-wise. He's going to come, he's going to need something soon. And the question comes in, now could we plug it? Right. I, I was going to really yeah. explain the same thing. Because he's not going to last long, I tell you. That combination of pressure and volume overload in a small cavity is not very good. And that, that would also argue for doing the CT because you get, a, you know, there's, there's so much shadowing in those images that you showed. It can be really tricky to miss stuff. So I mean, that would help you know if there was a pluggable hole yeah, go next. or how many. Good. Excellent case. Okay. Very good.